hour of our victory, the great hope of conservatives, as of all others, was that the peoples of the world might settle down to live in friendship through the United Nations organization. That organization had grown out of the wartime comradeship in arms of the United States of America and the British Empire and all the other countries which made common cause with us. Russia had adhered to the grand design of President Roosevelt and Mr. Churchill. Our hopes were dashed. The rulers of the Soviet Union, pursuing the creed of Karl Marx and their own expansionist aims, used the United Nations as a platform for their communist doctrines. At the same time, they conducted what has become known as the Cold War against the Western democracies. The blockade of Berlin, defeated by the airlift, was only the most flagrant of a series of provocations which made it clear that the liberties of the world have still to be protected. Here is an extract from the right road for Britain. If Britain is to carry out her responsibility as a defender of liberty, she must not only organize herself properly, but she must inspire all those countries who share her beliefs. Particularly, of course, the countries of the British Empire and Commonwealth. Mr. Eden, who recently made a tour of the Commonwealth, quotes another passage from the right road for Britain. We have in our worldwide circle a real brotherhood of mankind in which each member has much to give and much to gain. This structure must be fortified by positive acts of statesmanship. Conservatives would strive for closer consultation within the empire, including more frequent meetings of Commonwealth prime ministers, though not necessarily in London. The system of imperial preferences established at the Ottawa Conference in 1932 played a big part in Britain's recovery after the Socialist government's financial crash in 1931. Conservatives reserved the right to retain all preferences. The combination of Western European powers which met at Strasbourg has of course the full support of Conservatives for the scheme of Western Union sprang from the ideal proclaimed by Mr. Churchill himself at Zurich in 1946. Europe has recognized him as author of this grand conception of Western Union, even if Britain's socialist government has refused to do so. In contrast to this petty socialist attitude, conservatives have consistently supported the Labour government's foreign policy, since that foreign policy has followed slowly in the wake of what conservatives have proclaimed to be necessary. Also during 1946, Mr. Churchill spoke at Fulton in the United States, introduced by President Truman. Neither the sure prevention of war, nor the continuous rise of world organization will be gained without what I have called the fraternal association of the English-speaking people. That was the speech attacked by socialists as warmongering because it was the first to take a realistic view of Soviet Russia's policy and called for continuation of the fraternal association between the United States and the British Commonwealth. Conservatives heartily support that fraternal association and believe that the Atlantic Pact, now happily signed by the government of the United States, owes its origin in great measure to the far-seeing pronouncements of Mr. Churchill. It is essential that besides forming these close associations, Britain herself must remain strong. We have to combat the insidious infiltration of communism, as in Malaya. We have to protect menaced outposts of the empire, such as Hong Kong. But there is a dangerous weakness in Britain's defenses today, due largely to mismanagement, incompetence, and the lack of a coherent or suitable defense policy. The White Ensign has been fired on by the Communist army in China. And though the escape of the gallant amethyst down the Yangtze has thrilled all patriot hearts, let us not forget that it was only an escape. In these last four years, British warships have been mined with impunity off the coast of Albania. And in the Antarctic, 
South American politicians have landed and laid claim to British territory. The services, particularly the Army and the Air Force, are dangerously under strength in the number of long service regulars. Conservatives believe that the first step in curing present waste and weakness is to improve training and operational readiness by increasing the number and standard of regulars. To do this, we must attract more good recruits for the regular forces by improving the conditions of service which are still behind civilian standards. Conservatives, in fact, see clearly the tasks which by history and geography are Britain's responsibility. Our role is one of world leadership. We must restore our own greatness, so manifestly proved in the Second World War, and give courage and confidence to a bewildered world. Britain, in the course of her history, has produced many great men, but among her greatest, and few will deny it, is the leader of the Conservative Party today. The talents of Mr. Winston Churchill are still available in this crisis of our country's destiny. Mr. Eden sums up for us in the words of The Right Road. What Britain needs is not only a new government, but a new spirit to meet the crisis of her own destiny. Above all, she needs a new vision of the dignity and value of human life. Man was not made for the state, or to be merely an efficient automaton. Man is a spiritual creature, adventuring on an immortal destiny. And science, politics, or economics, are good or bad, so far as they help or hinder the individual soul on its eternal journey. This is an age of change, but there are unchanging truths. And in such times as ours, it is above all necessary to keep them before our eyes. Tell me, which is the right road for Britain? The right road, sir? Turn right. The signposts are clearly marked. They point the way.